tonight on CBC Vancouver News. All patrons must now be seated at a designated seat. There is no liquor self-service or dance floors. With COVID-19 cases rising, new restrictions at BC restaurants and bars also. The beach, I think you can do that reasonably safely. A drum circle, it's going to be a lot more challenging. Offbeat, concern from health officials after a large gathering on a Stanley Park beach and... Senseless slaughter, friends and family share their anguish as sentencing begins for the killer of a Vancouver couple. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, thanks for joining us. With new cases rising again tonight, BC is attempting COVID-19 crowd control by tightening restrictions in high-risk settings. Tanya Fletcher is here live again tonight. And Tanya, the provincial health order is being amended. So what kind of businesses is that going to apply to? Well, that's right. So it targets places where social gatherings are happening to try to curb spread in social settings. So the new rules blanket restaurants, pubs, bars and nightclubs. And here are the new orders. So under the new rules, all patrons must be seated at a designated seat. No dance floors are allowed. No liquor self-service is allowed. That means you can't walk up to the bar and simply order a drink. Also, strict measures must be in place to reduce lineups and avoid congregating. And as for restaurant goers, this message from provincial health officer dr bonnie henry if you're going out for dinner don't ask the service to accommodate more than six people no table hopping six people is what is restricted under our work safe guidance and our uh, public health orders so no trying to work around it by sitting separately and moving between tables and gathering that just puts others at risk and changes are also coming for requirements around events, but details are yet to be delivered on that. All right, so we'll wait for that. But uh, how is the restaurant industry reacting to these uh, amended rules? Yeah, the group that represents restaurants in BC was actually consulted about these heightened restrictions ahead of time, and it's overall supportive of the new measures. Uh, they are asking, though, for the rules to go even further when it comes to mandating masks for staff. Uh, the president says they're hearing a lot of confusion from customers about why some some servers wear them and others don't. You'll notice this if you've been out at the restaurants. So he's calling for a mandatory mask rule for all restaurant workers across the board and says more rules are actually a good thing for keeping people safe if they're effective, especially around, for example, requirements like customers providing their contact info. If you go to a restaurant, say, can you at least give us a first name and a phone number? If the person says no, then seriously, I don't think you let him in. Like, I think we have to be unfortunately a little bit inhospitable to deal with the very serious situation that we're in right now. And on the flip side of that, we've also, we've also heard from some uh, business owners on Vancouver Island. They want further clarification on the self-service at the bars, that new restriction. Some pub owners believe it would be uh, more risky to staff if they have to go and deliver drinks to tables to the customers instead. So we should know more specifics once the provincial health order has actually been posted. The amendments, that'll likely happen tomorrow. Leanne, Mike? More on that tomorrow. Thanks very much. Tanya Fletcher reporting live tonight. And the climbing case numbers are a big influence on those changes, with 34 more new cases announced today. That brings the total to 3,362. A ninth day without a death keeps that toll at 189. 70 positive tests have now been linked to exposures in Kelowna. And the province says more than 1,000 people are now self-isolating isolating rather, at home as a result of that outbreak. 2,888 people have recovered from the disease, leaving 285 known active cases. Now, when there are possible exposures to COVID-19, the public may not always be alerted. As Tina Lovegreen explains, it depends on how many people have been exposed and how difficult it is to track them down. This Earl's restaurant in Port Coquitlam is open again. It closed temporarily for a deep cleaning after three employees tested positive for COVID-19. Stricter regulations for restaurants and bars have come into play, but they're also putting some of the onus on the public. If you're going out for dinner, don't ask the servers to accommodate more than six people. What's not as clear is how and when the public is informed about possible exposures. 
It depends a little bit about um, you know, where the setting is that it's happened, how many people have been exposed, what type of exposure it is, and, uh, and whether we are able to effectively find people. If it's a high-risk exposure, contact tracers will directly phone people. But if there is no contact list, the local health authority sends out a public service announcement. And if it's considered low risk, the public may never find out about it. Only affected staff members will be asked to self-monitor and self-isolate. Part of the responsibility falls on WorkSafe BC. And since the pandemic began, they've done over 1,200 inspections of restaurants alone. We can't be everywhere, so the obligation is on the employer to do that. So far, it has issued more than 300 orders for health and safety violations. Nearly one-third were handed to businesses in the service sector, such as hotels, restaurants and gyms, and it plans to ramp up inspections. And we're actually going to start doing some inspections a little later into the evening, uh, when maybe more patrons are in those establishments. Uh, uh, they don't expect to see us there. In the meantime, some experts are advising people to stick to patios, where the risk of transmission is lower, and to do some safety checks of their own. If uh, you don't see any server with masks, gloves, uh, and if there's no plexiglass, I would, I would frankly turn around. I, I wouldn't stay there. And anyone who spots a violation is encouraged to report it to WorkSafe BC. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. A large drum circle being held every Tuesday night has the potential to be what experts call a super spreader event for COVID-19. Videos of the event at Third Beach in Stanley Park last night were shared on social media. As CBC's Mickey Cowan explains, experts say having events outside isn't enough. All of a sudden you go down to the beach and there's, you know, hundreds of people. Doesn't matter how old they are or whatnot, but just out there just kind of spitting in the face of the rules. The video shows dozens of people dancing at a drum circle. There's little physical distancing and far more than the 50 people gathering limit. Ryan Schapp saw the event in person from a distance. It didn't look like it at all. It was uh, one of the more like reckless things I've seen since the whole pandemic started. He was at the beach physically distancing with a friend. They left as the crowd grew. I just wanted people to know that there's some dangerous behavior happening and, you know, the opposite of what we should be doing. Officials say this type of event can be risky. Being outside means it's less risky, but it's not zero risk. The possibility of what we call a super spreader event, where one patient with COVID-19 could spread it to dozens or even hundreds of other people, is something that can happen at an event like this. Curry says if people are touching each other or speaking very closely, it puts them at a higher risk. If anyone at the drum circle had the disease, it could make contact tracing difficult. Presumably these people don't know each other. I don't think there was a registry for people participating in the drum circle. Health officials agree overall going to the beach can be a safe activity, but only when combined with physical distancing. We are appealing to people again to remember that and to keep your group small. Stay a distance, your safe distance from other small groups. And then you can enjoy the beaches, you can enjoy the sunsets. Something Ryan Schaap hopes people take to heart. Don't go against all the hard work that this province has put in just to have a hippie drum circle. At this point, it doesn't look like there will be a major clampdown on events like the drum circle. The park board says enforcing public health orders is the province's jurisdiction. And provincial officials say their primary approach is to provide education and guidance. Mickey Cowan, CBC News, Vancouver. And the BC Centre for Disease Control has released new guidelines for sex during the pandemic. It's offering tips and strategies to help reduce the spread of COVID-19 between partners. The public health agency says while the virus has been found in semen and feces, it's not clear if it can be transmitted through sex, but it is spread through respiratory droplets. So it says the safest sex is solo or masturbation. Virtual sex like video dates or sexting also keeps people safe from transmission. For sex with a partner, the health agency says you're safer if you limit the number of partners, skip sex if you're sick, ask your partner if they have any COVID-19 symptoms, wear a face covering, avoid kissing, limit face-to-face -face positions, use barriers, condoms, and dental dams, and wash your body and any toys before and after.
So it comes back to taking the basic hygiene that, you know, we've learned so well through Dr. Bonnie Henry and then adding the safer sex practices to it. And communication is probably one of our greatest skills when it comes to this. So really honest dialogue about, have you been at a party with people outside your bubble? The CDC is also reminding people that services testing for HIV and STIs are still available. Clinics are still open and the BC CDC has a confidential online system available for use. An Abbotsford police officer badly injured while responding off-duty to a dispute in Nelson last week has now died. 55-year-old Constable Alan Young was intervening in a disturbance in the downtown area when RCMP say he was assaulted with a weapon. Young and the attacker didn't know each other. Abbotsford Police Chief Mike Sir says Young was an important member of the force and a person who made a difference. Alan was absolutely an incredible person to be around. He, he was light, he was fun, he was smiling, and I feel very privileged that I had the chance to get to know Alan. <clears throat> Police in Nelson say a 26-year-old suspect has been arrested. The suspect had been charged with aggravated assault, but officials are now also considering homicide charges. Young had been with the Abbotsford Police since March of 2004. Emotional victim impact statements in a BC courtroom today at the sentencing hearing for Rocky Rambo Wayne M. Cam. Cam killed Diana Ma Jones and Richard Jones at their South Vancouver home in September 2017. The couple did not know their killer, but through the trial, court heard Cam planned elements of their slayings and carried them out with savage violence. CBC's Rafferty Baker has more on today's sentencing hearing. A guilty verdict for first-degree murder carries an automatic life sentence with no chance of parole for 25 years. But the question remains, will Rocky Rambo Waynam Cam serve two consecutive terms or will he receive a concurrent sentence? And when will he be eligible for parole? This hearing is an opportunity for family and friends of the victim to share details of their loss. What did these murders mean for their lives? Crown Prosecutor Daniel Mulligan read statements from Ma Jones' niece who said she started sleeping with a nightlight. She says the world suddenly seems like a much scarier, awful, evil place. Her sister says she's haunted by thoughts of Ma Jones' last painful, terrified moments. Her social group feared they might be the next targets of a crazed killer. Without exception, the statements Mulligan read spoke of the deep sense of loss and grief in the wake of the killings. They struggle with the question, why? Mulligan said the barbaric and brutal murders carried out by Cam warrant consecutive terms, meaning he wouldn't be eligible for parole for 50 years when he's well into his 70s. Cam's lawyer argued that the court should not abandon the possibility of rehabilitation and he should be eligible for parole in 25 years. The hearing continues tomorrow. A decision is expected early next week. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, Vancouver. A man has been charged in an alleged hate crime attack on an elderly Chinese man in March of this year. 50-year-old Jamie Allen Besenson has been charged with one count of assault in connection with an attack on a 92-year-old man in East Vancouver. During the afternoon of March 13th, the victim, who suffers from severe dementia, wandered into a convenience store. The suspect began yelling racist remarks at him and shoved the elderly man causing him to fall to the ground and hit his head. The suspect is due to appear in court August 10th. The weather update is brought to you by Fortis BC. Using more energy these days, we've got energy saving tips, easy upgrades, how-to videos, and more. All right, first check in. Oh, oh, goodness me, it's a little Crazy. windy out apparently tonight. <laughs> Let's check in with uh, meteorologist <laughs> Johanna Wagstaff. You know, you're turning us, uh, well, some of us at least, into cloud nerds. You were talking about uh, uh, the cirrus clouds last night. Is that some fair weather cumulus that I see bubbling up over the North Shore? Or could I be mistaken? He's been waiting to use that. Very <laughs> impressive. <laughs> I am impressed wrong, big but... time. Yes, this is exactly <laughs> no fair weather cumulus. In fact, here we go. We've got some cirrus up there, but you nailed it. Uh, yes, uh, A plus for Mike and uh, Leanne. You remembered uh, <laughs> Fibratus last night. So 
I am doing well with my uh, 101s. Uh, we've got uh, some more clouds to talk about on the forecast for tomorrow morning and Friday morning, and they might come with some precept. But first, I wanted to uh, talk about something else happening offshore. I want to show you a map of the seismicity on our west coast over the past 24 hours. It's been busy, of course. Uh, you may have heard about the one happening uh, early this morning off the coast of Vancouver Island, about uh, 220 kilometers west of Tofino, magnitude 5.4. Uh, no one felt it, but that is significant enough to note. Of course, this is our area of high seismicity. And then uh, yesterday or last night into early this morning, magnitude 7.8 in southern Alaska. That is a significant earthquake felt 500 kilometers away in Anchorage. Uh, people were uh, evacuated and moved to higher levels. A very small tsunami, no damage reported. But again, a couple of uh, moderate to large size earthquakes to note. Of course, uh, the west side of North America and particularly where we live, definitely high seismicity. Uh, we're tracking, as I mentioned, a new system rolling in weather-wise, and that is going to bring us a few showers tomorrow morning and Friday morning. So I want to time it out, but let's leave you with a quick look at those temperatures. 22 in 3YBR. We briefly hit 23 earlier. I think I've got some more uh, 25s up my sleeve if you stick around for the long range. We are certainly going to stick around for that. Thank you, Joe. Well, the District of Squamish is looking at banning camping in any public place. Last year, its council passed a bylaw prohibiting camping on huge swaths of public land, but now they want to go further. Details of the ban were presented on Tuesday. In the past, wildfire risk, waste management and wildlife interaction were cited as concerns. Now, the recommendation from staff is citing COVID-19 as a reason. The proposal says a lack of sanitation infrastructure poses a threat to vehicle dwellers and the public. It says there are low-cost campsites available, but they need the new bylaw and subsequent enforcement of it to move people to those sites. We all live in community together, which means we have to give up some of our individuality and our individual rights so that we can all get along. The challenge is finding that balance, and I, I, I will bet you today that we won't make everyone happy, but we are continuing the conversation to try and find better solutions. The bylaw was given first three readings yesterday at Council. Now you can send in your written comments on the proposed amendment before it goes for a vote on July 28th. And the province is launching a new day pass program for some parks to help control crowding during COVID-19. The new day pass project aims to help people maintain physical distancing while enjoying everything BC has to offer. Six of our more popular parks are part of this program. They include Mount Robson, Stawamis Chief Park, Cypress, Mount Seymour, Garibaldi Park, and Golden Ears Park. Folks will have to book their free day pass before they plan to visit. The new passes will be released daily at 6 a.m. starting next Monday. Well, riding the, bi the bus has gone to the dogs, you might say. Yes, TransLink opened its doors to guide and service dogs in training today. Dozens of the four-legged commuters rode the bus today at the Vancouver Transit Centre to help familiarize themselves with the experience. The dogs from Delta-based BC and Alberta guide dogs have been tugging at the rain for their chance. Their training schedule has fallen behind, though, because of COVID-19. The experience helps handlers find which of the furry recruits are cut out for the big ride. According to TransLink, the dogs enable some customers to safely and confidently travel on public transit and are welcome at all times of service. Very, very important. Yes, absolutely. Okay, just a quick reminder, you can also watch this newscast live on the free CBC Gem app. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. And be sure to follow the both of us and Johanna on Instagram and Twitter. Well, more follow tonight from our story on allegations of staff harassment by the Governor General. Coming up, the promise to improve working conditions at Rideau Hall. And thanks for staying with us online through the TV commercial break. Well, the end of this month marks the 150th anniversary of the birth of one of Canada's earliest sports heroes. Yeah, famed boxer George Dixon was from the historic Halifax community known as Africville. And as the CBC's Emma Davey tells us, local organizers will be unveiling a mural in his honor to mark the occasion. 
artists are hard at work transforming this old sea can with a mural dedicated to one of Africville's most famous figures, world boxing champion George Dixon. This July marks 150 years since he was born in the small black community in Halifax's North End. His appeal is international because uh, George Dixon was the first person to win two world titles, more than two world titles uh, in those days. And also, um, you know, he is credited for, for creating shadow boxing, which all boxers use today. Dixon left Halifax at age 16 to pursue a career in professional boxing in Boston. They have a lot of great records in the museum, so we used uh, some old articles, old photos of uh, fights, like posters, and uh, yeah, we kind of wanted to use some older imagery and kind of keep it classic looking, but other than that, we just kind of wanted to have it nice and uh, colorful. But the organizers want to keep exactly what the mural will look like a surprise. Bert was also one of the artists behind the murals in Mulgrave Park, the project aims to revitalize the area and bring attention to places that are often underrepresented. I hope it adds to the overall culture and, uh, you know, the look of the community, but I also hope it brings some awareness to bring people in to see the communities and actually react with people and see what conditions they're in and try to uh, improve that in any way we can. When I drive by Barrington Street or Mulgrave Park and I see the art on those buildings, I just know how it makes me feel. It makes me feel so excited and so uh, proud to be a Nova Scotian. The other thing it does uh, for people is it makes them ask, who was that person? And that's what we want. We want people to be more connected to the history. Juanita Peters says the unveiling event will also be a chance to showcase the struggles still faced by community members today. There's going to be a group that are part of the walk, stroll, a bike, who will be coming down here to show how very difficult, first of all, it is to get to Africville. After all these years, we need public transportation down here. And then while they're here, we will unveil this beautiful, it's like a gift. <laughs> we will unveil this beautiful piece of artwork. The mural's unveiling will take place at the Africville Museum on Saturday at 2 o'clock. Emma Davey, CBC News, Halifax. Some stunning murals there. You think you know most places, maybe, and mm -hmm. I've never heard of uh, Africville, but uh, yeah. very cool. Very so nice. many Canadian gems and special communities to discover. Yeah, that one with a great history as well. Mm. Hey, uh, stay with us uh, in just a couple of seconds. Uh, we're going to take you through the fallout and there's plenty of it from our exclusive story on allegations of bullying and harassment against Canada's Governor General. Back in just a sec. I'm CBC journalist Will Fundal, and I'm non-binary. But what exactly does that mean? We'll answer some of the gender questions you always wanted to ask in our new podcast, They and Us. Listen now. Well, at this very moment, companies right across the globe are coming to grips with an anti-black reckoning within their own ranks. Tonight, a CBC News investigation reveals the public broadcaster is no different. In an exclusive interview, a black former CBC employee details his experience and the corporation's response. Katie Nicholson has the story. This all happened in April of 2019 at the Fifth Estate at an all-staff meeting. A room of more than 30 people watched a BBC documentary on racism in the southern U.S. that used the N-word 12 times. Now, according to witnesses in that discussion that followed, host Gillian Findlay and editor Loretta Hicks repeated that word. Senior leadership were in the room and no one said anything. Associate producer Dexter Brown was the only black person in the room. Because they should have known better. Um, I feel like they should have known that that word has a lot of power in it. In an email, Finley says she doesn't remember using the word, but says, if, however, my memory is wrong and I did quote someone from the film using the word, I apologize. It should not have happened. Hicks declined comment. Catherine Legg did not respond to multiple requests for comment, and Marie Colose said she is unable to speak due to confidentiality. Brown met with the show's boss the next day, but there was no resolution. Two weeks later, he complained to HR and asked to be moved off the show. 
but says he was offered other positions, but he wasn't satisfied with the options and stayed put. In the end, CBC hired an outside law firm to review the incident. It dragged on for months, but he wasn't allowed to see the final report or any details about what CBC planned to do to prevent future incidents. The Canadian Association of Black Journalists says CBC should have done better. I think a company has a responsibility to ensure that it is dealt with quickly and not, not just disciplinary action, but to ensure that the person who suffered the pain, who suffered the most hurt out of this situation is handled with care. CBC declined an on-camera interview, but in a statement says the investigation into the incident was comprehensive and there were corrective actions, but couldn't say what they were. And the public broadcaster has promised to make big changes, including hiring and promoting more people of color and introducing mandatory bias training. I hope, you know, through all of this, uh, all this craziness that um, you know, there's some positive change. Um, that people feel safer um, working at CBC. <sighs> it's too late for Dexter Brown, who left for CTV earlier this spring. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. And plenty of reaction tonight to our exclusive report on what it's like to work for Governor General Julie Payette. More people have come forward detailing how they were bullied and demeaned in one of the highest offices in the land. Ashley Burke has the fallout. Justin Trudeau isn't part of the problems at Rideau Hall, but the NDP says he must be part of the solution. Will the Prime Minister show leadership and launch an independent investigation? Obviously, every Canadian has the right to a safe, secure workspace free from uh, harassment, and that is extremely important. Extremely important, but Trudeau isn't saying what action, if any, he'll take. It all comes after CBC News reported more than a dozen sources accused the Governor General, Julie Payette, of berating, belittling and publicly humiliating staff. Payette's secretary, Assunta De Lorenzo, is also accused of bullying employees. Definitely Radio Hall needs to look into this very, very carefully. Today, a public silence from Rideau Hall, but a private memo was sent to all employees last night, just hours after CBC's report. De Lorenzo wrote, I want you to know that I, along with the Governor General and the entire management team, am deeply committed to fostering a healthy work environment. We are here to listen and take action in order to keep improving our work environment. Please rise. She told staff to report any complaints, but sources say their issues would be dealt with by the very people they're complaining about. The Privy Council office said it's very concerned about the allegations and will be following up on these reports. A former cabinet minister says the government needs to take action now. This is a minority parliament. This is not simply a symbolic office. This is a hugely important office that has to have the confidence of Canadians. The Prime Minister could have a discussion behind closed doors with Payette to try and resolve this. Payette is the Queen's representative to Canada and Buckingham Palace is aware of CBC's report, but says it's a matter for the Governor General's office to handle. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, Finance Minister Bill Morneau was grilled by MPs today about his family ties to the WE organization. Then the Prime Minister's office announced an extraordinary development. Justin Trudeau will himself testify before the committee next week, something Prime Ministers almost never do. Evan Dyer shows us what led to that. Prime Minister Trudeau, Trudeau. 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 wasn't talking, but one likely reason was Bill Morneau's unexpected admission that the WE organization paid for two Morneau family trips in 2017, one to Kenya, another with his wife and children to Ecuador. Morno said he'd paid $52,000 to cover flights and other costs of those trips, but he couldn't find receipts for expenses related to WE activities. This was to my surprise. Yesterday, I asked my assistant to reach out to the WE organization regarding these trips and for them to provide me with the amount of total expenses incurred. Today, I wrote a check in payment of $41,366. Canadians will find it impossible to believe that this organization showered you with $41,000 worth of luxury and accommodations and that you didn't know about it. We paid for your travel. That has the apparent uh, perception 
of attempting to buy political influence. It's completely unacceptable for a finance minister, for any minister, to accept illegal trips, which is what uh, Mr. Morneau seems to have done, and uh, only paid the money back on the day that he was uh, scheduled to testify. Uh, so uh, we believe it's time for Bill Morneau to resign. In his defense, Morneau also testified that his family donated $100,000 to WE, half in 2018 and half just last month. It's not clear if that second donation was made before the current controversy started to gather steam. The subsidized family travel adds to a growing list of personal benefits that Trudeau and Morneau family members have received from the charity, including lucrative speaking fees, paid and unpaid jobs for the kids, and flights and hotels for the Prime Minister's wife. All questions the PM himself will now have to face, along with his chief of staff, when they both appear before the same committee. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Gatineau, Quebec. The survey reveals the impact COVID-19 has had on children with disabilities in BC. With many services still closed, we took a look at why one Canadian care centre is choosing to reopen next. at the three main breweries in British Columbia have been locked out over a pay dispute and parched beer drinkers have been seeking relief in Washington state. Reporter Bob Gillingham takes up the saga of the rush for beer at the Douglas Crossing Point south of Vancouver. British Columbians eager to beat the expected influx of Suds lovers to the border towns this weekend have already started trekking back and forth across the line with their purchases. Canadian Customs, braced for the onslaught, will have additional booths and crews at all points. Each individual is allowed to bring back two cases per trip. Customs official Graham Toomey says B.C. residents trying to exceed the limit will lose their beer. And if they're declared, they just pay the duty is what it amounts to. If they're not declared... Uh, if it's a certain amount, we can seize the beer and we can seize the vehicle. The thrifty market in Blaine will likely be one of the big winners because of the B.C. dispute. The store normally sells about $20,000 worth of beer a month, but anticipating the Canadian demand, the operators have brought in more than three times that much and are still worried about running out. The exodus of parched B.C. residents to the border towns of Washington State to buy beer has barely begun. But if the weather stays warm, and it's supposed to, there could be monumental traffic jams before the weekend is over. Bob Gillingham, CBC News, at the Douglas Crossing. If you started from the Atlantic provinces, this is your eighth or ninth boundary crossing. And if, like most of the kids, you're heading for Vancouver, most of the long journey is behind you. If you've learned nothing else, you've found out just how wide and wonderful this country is. And there's more ahead over the Rogers Pass, through the Selkirks, more rugged beauty. You wind along the shores of the Shuswap Lakes, and if you're new to mountain driving, there's a new thrill rounding a curve with no guardrail at 50 or 60 miles an hour. Finally, the mountains spread away from you. You're down into the rich flatland of the lower Fraser Valley. Vancouver is closer than ever, but rides are scarce, and it's still an 80-mile haul. Finally, here you are. There are hostels with indoor shelter. If you don't find one, you camp out. We found one group talking in French from four towns in Quebec. Well, what do they think of Canada now? It's uh, pretty big and uh, it's uh, not very populated, I guess. Would you still stick to it? Would you separate now? Well, I'd prefer Quebec anyway, like I was born there and I, I think my traditions and my mentality is French, Canadian, Quebecois. And I agree with English, they're allowed to live, but I think uh, in Quebec it should be uh, French, like everywhere in French. Like here it's a majority in English. You still want to be part of Canada? Uh, I'd rather a French country, uh, like Quebec. Journey's in. Mayor Tom Campbell is still not too fond of visiting hitchhikers, and the drug scene here, except for those who belong to it, is the worst you've found. It still accounts for only a small minority, and there are plenty of other things to do. The important thing is, you've finally made it. Norman Defoe, CBC News, Vancouver. And welcome back. As we told you earlier, BC announced today it's bringing in new restrictions for restaurants, bars and nightclubs as the province's COVID-19 numbers creep upward. 
34 new cases were reported, but no new deaths. As Breyer Stewart reports, the new measures come as frustration grows over large groups ignoring health protocols. A large sunset gathering, complete with dancing and drums, baffled some passing by last night. Holy crap. And it infuriated plenty of others. Don't go against all the hard work that this province has put in just to have a hippie drum circle. Ryan Schaap estimated the party swelled to over 100, much more than the province's ban on gatherings over 50 people. The people are left to police themselves, and, you know, for the other side of the beach that's following the rules, it was fine, but for that small yet large group of people, they, they chose not to. In B.C., where there's been an uptick of COVID cases, 34 reported today, there's been an increase in the number of young adults testing positive. But if you are in a crowded um, location. Being outside is not enough. We know that it can be transmitted when you're having close conversations. Today the province also tightened rules for some businesses. Anyone going to a restaurant or bar must have a seat. No one can get a drink for themselves and establishments have to ensure that people aren't crowded around. The group representing the province's restaurants wants to see one more change. All food service workers wearing masks. I think it's a good visual cue and it sort of shows that, you know, we are doing something because there's a lot of consumer confidence stuff going in this. How are you doing over here? Sure, good? Okay, good. At this restaurant, all the staff wear masks. It's already implemented the province's new rules, but it can still be a challenge to keep groups small. People are used to being at craft beer market, mixing, mingling, cheersing, all that, but we have to micromanage the heck out of those uh, situations. Because inside, restaurants can't seat any parties larger than six. But outside, where there's little enforcement, it still comes down to good judgment. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, the number of students with disabilities with no access to an education has nearly doubled since last year. That's according to a survey done to examine the pandemic's impact on schooling. BC Ed Access Society found 883 parents were unable to get proper educational assistance for their child. That's up 179% from last year. In many cases, parents were not properly informed that full-time in-person attendance was an option for students with disabilities once classes resumed. And many of those parents are feeling left behind during the COVID-19 crisis. It's a similar story right across the country, and that's why two specialized programs are choosing to reopen. For families able to go, it's their first real break since the start of the pandemic. Joanna Remuliotis takes us there. Rett syndrome is a genetic... A neurological disease that uh, Emily was diagnosed with just before she was two means that her body doesn't do what she wants it to do or what it should do. So basically her body doesn't work. Have fun at camp. We'll see you tonight. Be good. <laughs> Life isn't easy for six-year-old Emily Higgins, but there are bright spots and they're heading to one. Let's go get out. The camp Emily is going to is nearly an hour away. Oh my gosh, Emily. You are gonna have such a good day. But it's a lifeline. <sighs> yeah. Now more than ever. <laughs> you do love camp, huh? Even the first day I dropped Emily off and I, I said to my husband, like, I just feel like I can breathe now because it was just, it was really hard. Um, So, yeah, so it's better now because she's happy. It wasn't an easy decision. Emily's condition means she has trouble fighting infection. But it was a trade-off between managing the risk and the emotional toll staying home had already taken. She was missing her friends and through this, uh, she was also diagnosed with dystonia, which is basically really painful muscle spasms. Good morning. We'd seen it through the year, but all the things that were happening compounded it. So Emily would just cry all day. And so we would cry. It really was just survival mode. Okay, are you ready for an awesome day, my girl? That desperate need for a reprieve. It's why Kayla's Children's Center was determined to open. 
with precautions like temperature checks and bubbling groups of children and staff members. It's the only camp in the Toronto area for disabled and medically fragile children, the first respite parents have had in months. We had a lot of parents drive up and drop their kid off and then literally sit in their car and sob. Everything they've gone through over the last four months just hit them. Yaffe Scheinberg runs the camp. This year, like, these parents were so that They're at their breaking point. Good morning. And you have to understand that they don't have an option of saying, you know, I'm just going to take, like, an off day, a mental health day today, and I'm just not going to, you know, do all the bathing and the feeding and the, and the stuff that their kids need. And um, I feel like at, by the end of June, they were at the end of their rope. Have a good day. I'll see you later. Bye. 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 We have to watch her all the time. And you're constantly at the edge. It's unrelenting is a good word because we don't have the break or at least taking her to her a program. But you know, like everything else with these special needs, you don't have a choice, you just do it. Have a good time at home. Love you, have a great time. Rena and Gary Cogan's daughter Tanya is 42 years old. Tanya has cerebral palsy and is developmentally delayed. She's been home for the last four months and just started coming back here. There we go. Okay, let's do this. Danny is a day program for adults with disabilities. It looks different now, but they're together again. Feel again. See you, my friend, again. It's why co founder Kathy Laszlo made the call to reopen. Some participants are nonverbal, and you would think that what does it matter, right? So he sits here or he sits at home. So what's the difference, right? He, he's just sitting. It's not true. You can see the happiness on his face just to be here with his friends. They just need this, they really do. Coming back meant scaling back. Groups of five are cohorted in half days and staff get tested for COVID every two weeks. And everything is cleaned several times a day. It took a lot of time and money to put in all the safety measures, but Kathy says it's worth it. Seeing the joy on their face, worth everything we had to do. Yeah. Yeah. they all very happy even if they're not able to so much demonstrate they are very happy but when they are actually can demonstrate their happiness it gives us joy too holy smoke look at them all yeah for rena and gary it's a chance to drop their guard for a few hours to enjoy their garden and each other you're doing good yeah very well <laughs> often you know we are tense like even your body is constantly tense and you just sort of relax because we know she's in good hands where she is. And however lovely the break, it always comes back to one thing. But she's happy. That's what every parent wants, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. When she's happy, we're satisfied. <laughs> Happiness can be fleeting. The goal here, to keep recapturing it. Emily understands everything and uses a device to communicate. She tells us she's had enough of the sun and of us. Goodbye. <laughs> Tears here do dry more quickly. There are so many distractions. And Emily's mom is grateful for everyone. We've just seen Emily back to herself, happy, feeling good. Um, she has more patience, um, but there's been a huge difference in all of us. You know, I'm not crying every day. You know, I always say when Emily's happy, I'm happy. Um, so we're all in a really 
in, in a much better place. I am. I love you. Oh, you gotta get this aside there. Yeah. And it's all they all need to simply catch their breath. Have a good day. I love you. Come on in. One of your favorite activities ever. <laughs> Joanna Vermiliotis, CBC News, Thornhill, Ontario. Well, its doors have been shut for months, but a family fun staple is reopening soon. We'll have details on what science world amid COVID times will be like after the break. And at 643, a live look. There it is. Science world still closed for now, but it's a lovely night out around False Creek and beyond. Those clouds have lifted, but I hear they could be back soon. Johanna will have that forecast next. The main inspiration for the design was the garden. The garden, I felt, needed to kind of be honoured by the house. I wanted to feel like we lived in the garden. Hello, welcome to our home. My name is Stephen Scarlett and I am semi-retired. I own a manufacturing business. I'm Paul Sawinski, I'm Stephen Scarlett's husband. Well, I built the house really thinking I was going to be single for the rest of my days and kind of designed it for myself. Six months later, I met Paul. I came along as it was finished. I don't think there'd be one thing I'd change. We really designed the kitchen to be a non-kitchen because you enter the house and bang, you're in the kitchen. So um, although it is a kitchen, we wanted it to feel not too kitcheny. Yeah, I just always have really loved design and I come from a very scientific business that doesn't allow a lot of creativity. There are, there are rules and, and they're adhered to. So the, the process of design for me is delightful. My best friend, Bridget, fell ill with Lou Gehrig's disease. I was going to go back to school and study architecture. Right at the time she fell ill, I was accepted and, and going in. And I made the promise to Bridget that I would help her die at home. And we had people cooking meals and taking kids to school and doing laundry and, um, and we kept Bridget at home until she died. It was almost three years. Bridget made me promise that when she passed that I would let the artist out. And I did. <laughs> Here it is. And there's a spirit house down in the garden that's, that Bridget bought for me and said, please keep this in your garden. And I put a flower in it every week and think about Bridget. So this is a, a nano wall, and it opens up like so. So you can take one panel or two, or you can take all five. These doors weigh about 400 pounds each, but I can move them with one hand. They're so well set in this track, leveled and balanced. I was on site every day for the two and a half years while it was being built and worked with the architect and the builder daily on crafting different components and making decisions about how it would look and how it would come together, and I loved it. The beauty of it, for me, it's the beauty of it and the, just the tranquility. The actual structure, the, the height, the strength, the material, and just how it's plunked in nature. Everything else around it is sort of organic and I find concrete beautiful. I don't think we see enough of it, actually, in homes especially. And the concrete pieces were meant to feel like art. Yeah. They were meant to stand on their own and be admired. When we pull in that gate and it becomes mm -hmm. this little zen garden again and we're home. Well, BC parents looking for a kid-friendly holiday activity can now put science work world back on the summer bucket list. Yes, now that phase three of the government's pandemic response plan is in full swing, Science World is reopening its doors for the first time in four and a half months.
summer is one of our busiest times. That's what's really sad for us because busy times both mean visitors having a great time, but also mean Science World's getting the revenue that we really need to stay alive. And one of the things that our visitation does is it funds our outreach into the rest of British Columbia. So every year we touch 140,000 kids in every part of BC. So those kids that can't make it to Science World, we take Science World to them. The weather update is brought to you by Fortis BC. Using more energy these days, we've got energy saving tips, easy upgrades, how to videos, and more. To someone who I believe is a big fan of science herself, Johanna Wagstaff joins us again. So, Joe, what a beautiful night, hey? A bit breezy out there, but at least it's sunny again. It's gorgeous out here. Yeah, the breeze is actually quite refreshing because there's been a bit of a humidity built in. We've got an interesting sky, but a dry one. Uh, yeah, I don't want to give away my weekend plans, but I am 100% going to Science World with the little guy. So uh, I've got a nice forecast ahead for whatever your plans are. Uh, outdoor activities will probably do the best this weekend as high pressure builds back in. A couple of little waves, I'll call them, to uh, get through over the next few days. Uh, you can see this high cloud above me. That's going to thicken up and possibly produce some showers overnight into tomorrow morning. Take a look at the temperatures out there right now, or the Humidex, I should say. I've factored in the humidity, so still a little muggy. Uh, 25 right now at YVR, uh, 26 up towards Squamish. Uh, we've got a few afternoon showers popping up in the BC interior. Uh, that little system is going to track eastward, but we've got another wave rolling in for tomorrow morning. So uh, just a slight chance of a Thursday morning risk clearing out as we head into the afternoon. I think we'll see the sun again, very similar to today but better chance of showers and then as I take you through to Friday morning look at that one wave I think will get through best chance of showers this week happening Friday morning I think it'll clear out again for a sunny afternoon might take a little longer to clear out on Friday than tomorrow uh, but not a bad end to the work week it's Saturday and Sunday that that high pressure really builds back in and we get back into summer wanted to show you the forecast highs in through the interior a uh, 31 for a Soyuz tomorrow 28 and through Kelowna a little cooler as we head into Friday uh, but staying dry in through the southern uh, Okan the southern interior I should say Okanagan included and this is an area we're going to watch closely for thunderstorms tomorrow and Friday. Uh, just a slight risk tomorrow, better risk on Friday, uh, but that afternoon thunderstorm, or sorry, that afternoon fire danger uh, is quite high. You can see uh, oranges there are high with a few pockets of extreme. Uh, we definitely have to start thinking about fire danger and when we get lightning. Uh, that is our recipe for a new fire start. So again, heads up uh, Thursday and Friday, we could be talking new starts. Uh, that's also when we get our showers, as I mentioned, a little cooler out there with highs to 21. Then we see those temperatures building back in for Saturday and Sunday. Not out of the question, we'll be hitting the uh, 25s again for Sunday and Monday. Whatever you have planned this weekend, I don't think it's too early to start thinking about the weekend. Never too early. We will start thinking. Thanks very much, Joe. Well, beloved game show host Alex Trebek is celebrating his 80th birthday today. More than a year after being diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer. And with the love and support of my family and friends, and with the help of your prayers also, I plan to beat the low survival rate statistics for this disease. Trebek, who's been hosting Jeopardy since 1984, just released a memoir. In it, he says if current treatment for his illness is not successful, he'll likely stop medical intervention. Trebek was born in Sudbury, Ontario. He worked for the CBC, hosting television shows, covering sports and reading news on air. And he's won several Emmys for his work on Jeopardy. Happy 80th. It's an East Vancouver neighborhood where one in 10 residents identify as Indigenous. Coming up, how they're making a positive impact in Grandview Woodlands.
Today, one in 10 residents of the Grandview Woodlands neighborhood identify as indigenous. Yeah, with almost 2,300 First Nations, Inuit, and Métis residents in East Vancouver, you don't have to go far to see or experience their influence in that community. Well, Mish Hamilton from our Urban Nations Unit takes us there. You know, everything Indigenous happened there. It was one of the only places we could go to to see our people. So that was a big uh, part of the reason why we moved down here. It's a neighborhood that first began as timber mills in the early days of Vancouver. Now it's home to over 60,000 people from a diverse range of ethnic backgrounds. And it's most often here that Indigenous peoples moving from across the country choose to live. We have a large body of, of nonprofit Aboriginal housing in this neighborhood. There are 11 apartment buildings in the Grandview Woodlands area that are owned and operated by the Vancouver Native Housing Society. Affordable housing in an expensive city may be one reason why this neighborhood has attracted a large number of Indigenous people from across the country. We want to be here because our families are here, our friends are here, the Friendship Centre is here. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Indigenous uh, arts and crafts and stuff that take place in this, so it's a very welcoming place for our folks. Because you see yourself, you see our colour, you see our people. If you move into Richmond or any of the outlining areas, you don't see yourself. The East Van neighbourhood is also home to eight parks, Trout Lake being the biggest. The amount of green space in this area replaces the sense of being on the land many Indigenous people felt on their home reserves. And easy acceptance from a multicultural community also helps the transition to city living. The people in the neighbourhood are quite educated to our issues and they're very supportive. And so I feel very, you know, safe in my own neighborhood. Grandview Woodlands, or East Van as it's commonly known, is a melting pot of all of Canada's Indigenous peoples. Their presence here enhances the multicultural character of the neighborhood. Wami Shamilton, CBC News, East Van. Thanks to Wamish for that. I learned something new. Yeah, a bit, big draw for uh, the Indigenous community and, and others as well. It's uh, very popular. Yeah, I didn't realize. Mm -hmm. All right, you can always catch our newscast online at cbc.ca slash bc. Next local news right here at 11 o'clock with Dan Burrett after the National. Good night. Good night.